What is the best way to fine tune a disc that is robbing? A guy like Kasper Asgreen, he, he can be our colleague as a, as a mechanic, you know? You see the rider rolling up to the start line with like Remco, you know, red wrapped uh, bar tape. Mechanics have it tough. Pro level mechanics have it even worse. They're usually the last ones to leave the pits and the first to return in the morning. Their hours stretch out the working day, but there's no time to rest in the middle. They have to be on the tools at a moment's notice doing practice and could be faced with needing to make an emergency fix right before the rider's start time. Or maybe they're living it up doing what they love. In their eyes, they get to branch on the latest bikes and hang with the world's top riders. They're all part of a traveling circus, hopping from race to race on airplanes or long days of highway driving. Living out of a suitcase for weeks on end, they bounce in and out of hotels and up and down mountains across continents. We chatted with Nicolas Kosman's technical and development manager of Sudel Quickstep to find out more about the life of a world tour mechanic, their wireless fixes of all times, the evolution of bike equipment over the last decade and more. So without further ado, Nico, welcome to the show. We are thrilled to have you on the Castelli podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure. But before we get started with all the technical questions, tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey getting into the sport, and then where you are now. Well, it started back in like uh, 2007. I was working in a bike shop for three years, and I got the opportunity to work with a continental team, some uh, young guys from Belgium. Um, and I could do tour of Belgium with them. So that's where it started and it just grew. And I did like more and more races. And uh, yeah, it ended at the end of the 2012 season. Yes, um, because I got the opportunity to start in the quick step team, the big team. I got contacted by Kurt, my colleague, and um, it was like a dream that came true. So that's where it all started. So now, 12 years later, um, quite a lot happened, I must say. So I got six years ago the opportunity to become the head mechanic. And since last year, um, I could make another step and become the technical manager of the team. So I'm super proud to be part of this team um, and still after all those years, it's, it's still a dream. Oh, that's good too, because that is the burning passion for the sport and for what you do. And also, you know, the people that you have around you who, uh, but well, let me just rewind back a little bit till the day or the year that you said you started working as a bike mechanic, 2006, correct? Yes, correct. How old were you back then? In 2006, I was 22 years old. So then, be honest with us now. Could you then, when starting working as a bike mechanic, could you actually glue on a tire and change a chain or did you have to learn everything from scratch? Well, the years before, I tried to be a cyclist. So even just up to continental level and then I worked on my bike myself all the time. So I learned myself and I think I did well, so that's where I learned everything. And then just to steal with your eyes, just go around and just look around and learn from, you know, the mechanics in those times. Yeah. So I was watching movies, whatever I could pick up. So for me, it's like, since I'm six years old, cycling is my life. My wife is not going to like what I say, but <laughs> it's, it's the a really big part of my life so it I is. have my family but that's that's what I know it's a passion and it's what I love so and and you know what I've heard ex the exact same phrase from other world tour mechanics you know it is your second family it is you spend more time with the guys at the races than with your own family yeah I have to miss quite a lot of just random parties or whatever with yeah. the family because we are just on the road how many 
days do you then actually travel during a full season? In the beginning, I did like 200 days and even more, uh, included like days in service course. So um, now I ended up with 120 days. So a little bit more time at home, but also more responsibility. So Also in the early years starting out uh, as a bike mechanic, you probably had someone learning you the ropes, like a mentor. They are still here in the team. They're so, still here. So when I came, the guys like Kurt, Dirk, yeah. Frank, Guido, we are still here all together. And we spoke about it yesterday evening. We had a small meeting with the mechanics and we are so proud. We, after all those years, we are still just together. Yeah. And now with the young guys coming in the team, we have a few new guys. Um, I just told them like, guys, just look up to those guys because they have like a big back backpack, you know, with all the experience. So yeah, you better listen to what they say. And learn some of the best. Yeah. I like to hear that because, you know, as a professional cyclist, a neo pro and up, you always have that one person that gets their foot in that door that shows them the ropes. They're there to help and succeed rather than, you know, happy that they fail. Someone that always shows you the way and guides you. Yes. So that's cool that your network of mechanics have the same sort of support group and the same sort of story. Yeah, but it's also if, if we have to make a decision, I always go around and ask what they think. I'm not going to take a decision on my own. and. That's like a kind of respect in yeah. both directions. And that is teamwork. And and I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna get into that a little later when it comes to the evolution of bike equipment over the last decade, because that's probably gonna be very exciting. Yes. But before, at your level, at the world tour level, what makes a good mechanic? Because as you said before, you're on the road a lot of days during the year. You see your the team and the riders and the other staff more than you see your own family. What is it that makes a good mechanic? It just starts with a passion you need. And from there, the will to learn, to listen, and just to do the best you can, yeah. to give what you can. So that's actually, it sounds easy, but it's not always easy. I can imagine because you said the word passion a few times already. And yeah, you're completely right. A good mechanic doesn't only need to have the skills to be a good mechanic. I think it all boils down to passion, passion for the sport, passion for the riders, passion for the job. What motivates you to go above and beyond when things are tough on the road? Um, it's always hard to travel a lot, just to leave your family. Yeah. Um, when it's your child's birthday, maybe, or like yesterday, it was Mikael Landa's birthday. Yes. You know, he told me yesterday that he always celebrated his birthday, apart from the COVID year, but with the teams and the riders he, you know, worked with in the past, yeah. you now with his family. Yeah, but it's something that, that grows with the years, the experience you have, and you get a little bit used to, yeah. I must say, but yeah, still family is priority so yeah let's move in a little bit towards bike racing now is it mandatory for a mechanic to have a truck license does every mechanic need a truck license uh, in these modern days it is it is you have to it's it's like your tool you bring it everywhere to the races so you spend a lot of time in the truck, so it's mandatory. We give them when they arrive, like a little bit of time to get their license. But if it doesn't go fast enough, yeah. we can push a little bit to just wake them up yeah. and say, guys, we are also a kind of small truck driver sometimes. So yes, we do. Because we know that the mechanics, uh, well, they move the truck. They also drive in the team cars. They need to be flexible in any matter. And especially, let's talk about one of the big things now, like a Grand Tour. At a Grand Tour, can you take a listener through what you guys do first? What do you guys do last? What time do you go to bed? You know, just for our listeners to understand, because I know it's some long days for you guys at 
the bigger races. And it's not just one week, it's full three weeks on from early morning before everyone else gets up. And you're probably also the last ones that are hitting the bed in the evening. Yes. So let's say you start the day around six o'clock. It can be 5.30, it can be earlier, a little bit later, but let's say we start at six. So you wake up, get ready. If possible, you get a breakfast immediately. If if not, you just start your job. So we go to the truck, start to pump all the tires we have, put the bikes on the roof. And actually the, the main job comes later to prepare the bike. So in the morning we are actually quite easy just to get some air in the yeah. tires. Then if we got breakfast, okay, then we leave. We go to the start. So there we spare bike stays on the roof with the race bikes. We put them in front of the buses and so the riders can get ready. There we adjust the, the tire pressure that uh, it depends on the rider, the weight, whatever. So you already have a list? We have a list, yes. Okay, but do also then, sorry for interrupting you here, but then also the riders, are they all on same tire width? Specialized, they're going 26, 28 and 30, I guess. Yes. Uh, are they all with same the tire width or can the riders also choose? It depends on which, which race, let's yeah, say. Maybe. If it's a Grand Tour, yes, they are all on the same width, like, let's say 26 millimeter every day, so. And then it only depends then on the individual tire yeah, pressure. Yeah, on the classics, mm -hmm. uh, there you have the different width of tire and the yeah. pressure you play more with. Yeah. But yeah, also like the climbers and, and lightweight guys, they go lower in pressure, which is just yeah. normal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's some of the testing, of course you do doing training camps, you do it doing recons and... Uh, yeah, that's something we do actually always together with specialized yeah. tests. We do some rolling resistant tests and whatever on a drum. So yeah, we're quite good on on those things with them. So... That's because the rolling resistant test, one thing is to do it in, in a lab. Another thing is when you do it outside. And especially on different riding surfaces or pavements like cobbles, gravel, rough tarmac, potholes. I mean, that completely changes everything. Yes, but the good thing is we have a few smart guys in the team, let's say smart riders that they give us the feedback that we actually need to improve or adjust. And then we do it together with specialized. So they have their own test lab and it goes quite smooth, I must say. Yeah. No, it's great. It's great to hear that. But it's also what we see on the clothing, that the riders feedback that's then being filtered through you guys and then being brought over to, to us at Castelli. It's very good. It's spot on. It's very productive in a way that it can help us improve the, the clothing and the materials. And uh, so that's fantastic. Yeah, no changes is like standing still and yeah. running behind. So. Yeah. So we always tell, you know, that yourself or partners that, you know, there is no negative feedback i mean it's constructive everything because only positive feedback will never gonna make you take one step further ahead so yeah exactly okay so talking about the trucks we all know that you guys have a whole world to have these fancy trucks and thank goodness for that because they have air conditioning, correct? They have yes. heaters. So you guys aren't working out in the cold as back in the old days. But one thing is also that big truck has to be moved, that mobile village from hotel to hotel. And what are the, some of the challenges that you guys face when moving that big truck? Because sometimes you have longer transfers, you have to go through small villages, park it in a very narrow and tight spaces. Can you tell us a little bit more about how all that logistic works? Well, if if we go from hotel to hotel, we are actually with two persons in the truck. So it can help if you have like a hairpin in the mountains. So you can look one guy on the right side and one on the left side, yeah. just that everything goes well. So, but yeah, in the mountains, let's say that's that's the most difficult thing. So yeah. long travels, we, we are a little bit used to. So that's okay. And highway, yeah. It's just going straight so but yeah mountains is, is for us like we are not like a full-time truck driver so often 
you drive a car, then you drive a truck. So you have to get a feeling sometimes back with, but yeah. Then the guys get to the hotel, then they need to sort out the parking and they need to make sure that they have access to water, electricity for the high pressure cleaners and this goes on. What are some of the, the strangest, most weirdest things or most difficult situations you've ever experienced in your life when getting to the hotel? Well, it happens that you just arrive to the hotel and you ask like, can we connect water? And you say like, ah, it's not possible. So <laughs> we cannot do our job without, no. you know, it doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes it happens. So then you have to find a solution and we're always able to find a solution, but. But also with all these years of experience, but there are some, I assume someone from the team that have already been in contact with the hotel, but also when it comes to nutrition or cooking, I know you also have your your truck here when it comes to for for the kitchen. But but still, you know, there has been some logist a list of logistic things or needs that the team will have. But still, yeah. these things uh, can surprise. They always get in contact months before you go to a hotel. So trying to get the room the rooms whatever they ask the space we need so that they can just keep us a parking spot for the vehicles we have to to park yeah you know so but is it the same all over like france spain italy is it kind of this the same you see everywhere or there's some countries that are more difficult uh maybe it's culture wise you know to mm, i won't say difficult it's just like the hotels you come they are used to getting bike teams you yeah, know yeah. so they know how it goes or most of them they know so no not really difficult not really. okay so now we got to the hotel and let's say for next day you need to maybe specialized to have a new bike they want the riders to ride or maybe there's been a crash so you guys need to build up more bikes how long does it take for a mechanic to build the bike right out right out of the box dialed it into the exact millimeter of the rider's position how long does it take to a build the bike and then b get the rider to be 100 happy with that bike um to build a bike it takes let's say around it depends on the person who 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 can build it or just the speed. So, um, but let's say two and a half hour. And if if we just include the positioning, so it's three hours. Three hours. Each bike. So, and then it depends on the rider. So one is more secure than the other one. So yeah, we are trying to put a position as correct as possible, but it's always important to get the feeling on the bike. So the rider is, the pilot on the bike so yeah. he decides what he wants so yeah let's say again half an hour just to adjust small things and yeah just put the seat like so then the rider will take the bike for a spin and then maybe come back and say can you do you sometimes even give the rider an allen key or a tox wrench in the hand and have them like we all amateurs, we do that. We ride around, you know, maybe with an Allen key in a back pocket or maybe around the parking lot. A guy like Kasper Asgreen, he can be our colleague as a, as a mechanic, you know, he can know build he a bike builds. and he can. Yeah, I know he know. builds his bikes. Yeah. But then you have other guys, they say like, can you do it? Because I'm not used to. So, but that's why we are there. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But also getting into that whole fine tuning of the rider's position. Do you think the mechanic needs to have a bit of psychological know-how, you know, working with riders? I mean, you have a rider showing up saying, hey, can you lower my seat by one millimeter? Or can you angle my saddle and nose tip of my saddle like one degree further down because I don't feel comfortable? For sure, you need patience and you have to understand that, yeah, they think different than what we do because they just live in their cocoon, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> you have to accept and it's probably strange to say, but if you don't do it, it's not a job that fits with you. Right. So yeah, it's, it's just normal. It's normal. Yeah. But sometimes maybe then yeah, you have a writer saying, 
you know, can you lower it by one millimeter? And the mechanic will be, yeah, yeah, I'll lower it. And the rider comes back and thinks the mechanic did it. But of course, no, everyone knows that it's not going to change anything in the rider's performance. And the rider will just be happy because it's a mental thing. Yes. It's, uh, yeah. No. You just do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It plays a boy effect. Yeah. Or the last couple of years, we have seen a greater mix of tires in the pro peloton. What do riders prefer these days? Riding with tubes, tubular, or tubeless? Um, it also depends on the race course, of course, but I think... Yes, but you actually can split them in two groups. Yeah. You have the older generation, they were used to tubulars. Yeah. So they always choose like tubulars is like gold for them. And then you have the younger generation, they, they actually don't care. You know, they just want to go fast, as fast as possible. And if it's with a tubular, with a, just a tire, just with an inner tube or tubeless, for them, it doesn't matter. And then you have those guys that think with you, they just push and they go for the new stuff. And yeah, because yeah, you have to improve. And I think on tubulars, there was no room to play anymore so yeah there's a lot of room to play you're right when it comes to tubeless for sure both with the liquid but also with the, the inserts mm -hmm. do you then run them tubeless for with inserts for yes. Roubaix? yeah in the yeah. rear only rear only rear yeah okay. because we have a really wide rim so there is almost no risk on pinch flats so but on the rear there is it's a narrow rim just yeah. we got pinch flats. Pinch flats all the time. All the time. So yeah. we, got, we got the new tire now. So really strong. So. But but also for a couple race like Rupebo or Flanders, the tire seal in, how much would you add to each tire? 15 mil or? 15? We add actually 80. 80? Yes. Wow, that's because a lot of liquid. Because the insert absorbs a little bit of, okay. of sealant. So yeah. you have to count like. 15 or 20 milliliter that just goes or sticks around the, yeah. the inserts yeah. so that you lose. So you add some weight as well, but it's better to be sure. To be sure, yeah. And especially for a race like Roubaix. Yeah. If you get a flat tire, the race is over. So then on the front, you do the same, the 80 mils. Also, yes. yeah. The chat I had with the team and Beat yesterday, was a team, he said, always cotton tires. Yes. Because I asked him, will he brought, you know, tubeless or tubes? Both of them said tubes. You know, both of them yesterday. That was not even one second of not even Tim like tubes. And then Tim he added on and always cotton tires. Maybe some of the riders coming from cyclocross, they're better used to that technical aspect of playing around with the tire pressure and the the grip, the traction. Yes, exactly. But that's why if we do a kind of testing or rube testing, we involve for sure a guy like Tim Merlier because he has the feeling with right. tire pressure and yeah. Because he's used to from, from cyclocross. Correct. So, yeah, that helps us so nice. much. I can imagine. On a side note here, talking about tires, how many tubulars have you mounted in your life? I cannot put a number on it, but what I know it? that we use like 1200 tubulars every year. If you count like 10 mechanics, you mount for sure 120 tubulars a year for some years so what is an easy trick to get a tubular a glued super glued tubular off the rim we use a screwdriver but you don't can no, scratch the rim no. so you just pull on it and just turn like a turning screwdriver something round yeah so you just pull and try to make the wheel rolling a little bit so yeah. you go around it's actually yeah how it goes Okay, back to this episode. So we had a grand tour. We got to the hotel. We built the race bike, uh, the race bikes. Then the race starts. After a few days, maybe on stage one, one of your riders will get one of the leader jerseys. It can be any leader's jersey. It can be the yellow. It can be the red welter jersey. It can be the polka dot jersey or the Maglia Rosa of the Giro. At Castelli, we always make sure that we supply the team with extra yellow, red, pink colors for the GC riders in advance. Coming back to La Vuelta, what happens not only on Sudel Quickstep, but also the other teams the day after 
one of the riders got one of the leaders jerseys. You see the rider rolling up to the start line with like Remco, you know, red wrapped uh, bar tape, uh, sometimes even a red bike. What is happening? Is that a bike that you guys have stored back in the truck or something that's being shipped? How is all that unfolding? Well, you know, uh, a Grand Tour, you always win at the end. So for us, it's like a kind of rule that we start with details. So bar tape, bottle cages, like uh, the the cage, mounts, whatever, just small details, details in the right color. And then just at the end of a Grand Tour, so we could only win one for now, and let's hope we can do more. But um, we get the frame like, let's say on Friday, when the Grand Tour finishes on, on Sunday. Yeah. So you can actually not build it before. Some of the teams, they just store them in the truck. It's uh, <clears throat> a little bit different with us. And that is of course be coordinated just like with Castelli, but coordinate directly with Specialized. Is it then Specialized saying, hey, you know, we want you guys to ride in this bike if the rider takes the overall and we only want to see the red bike or maybe hopefully this year a yellow bike uh, at the end of, uh, of of the tour. So it would never be showcased during the, the race. Like some teams to pull out even a polka dot. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, we would love themes. to do that, but it's something that we decided to get it with specialized and yeah. it's that, their philosophy, I must say, to just do it at the end. Yeah. Also because it's not just one bike, it's also the spare bikes. And then who knows, maybe that rider will lose the polka dot jersey and then what are you going to do? Then you need to bring the old bike bikes back and yeah. Okay. So nowadays, almost every World Tour team uses disc brakes, right? Yes. All of them now? I think all of them. Yeah. When the change happened, did you and your mechanics go on a training camp to train the wheel changes? You know, how how did you, how was the swap? Um, I think we were one of the first teams, uh, probably the first team on disc brake or fully disc brake. So, and we played actually on, on the training camp in December together with the riders, just that's something we did to put tires on and just all together to get it as fast as possible and just to put a wheel with this brake. So, and then to do it every day, you get used to, but in the beginning, yes, you just try to do it faster and yeah, find a way that I can do it this way or that way. Because I remember the first season, most teams, they would swap the bike rather than the wheel just because it was quicker. Yeah. But now this has also changed. Yeah, you get used to because we were a little bit scared that it would take too long. And it, it also depends on, on the moment in the race. Yeah. If, if it's in the final, you just give a bike because it's just faster. But yeah, um, you get used to and you actually don't think anymore that with like rim brake yeah. how it was. How quick can a mechanic change a rear wheel? with mounted with disc doing a race? I think it goes super fast with a true axle, with the drill we have. It takes like not, not even 15 seconds. Not even 15 seconds, yeah, that's quick. That's very quick. So. And there is no complaints from the riders. It's difficult to hear, of course, when you're in a race situation, but maybe sometimes it could happen that the disc is rubbing just a little bit if it's on the wheel. Yeah, in the beginning it was a little bit an issue we had, but also on those things got some improvement, you know. Big improvements, yeah. This got solved, so yeah. it's not a thing that, that happens daily anymore. Yeah, what is the, talking about rubbing and talking about disc, for an amateur cyclist, I mean, we all like, I think 80% now of, of cyclists today are riding with discs. What is the best way to fine tune a disc that is robbing? And what is the general rule of thumb of maintenance? The best thing is when it's rubbing, it's because of the, the caliper is not centered. So that means that you just open the pistons in the caliper again, just that you get space enough. Then you just unscrew the caliper himself on the frame and then you just pull just on the brake but don't pull too hard too just hard, yeah. easy and then you just screw the two screws against not too tight and then you just lose it double check again just put some 
white paper on the ground just to see if the rotor is in the middle of the caliper and then tie a little bit more the, the two screws and it should be good. It's actually quite easy the moment you know how it goes. That's a really good procedure and actually an easy one. It's it's super easy, yeah. but you need the, the right tools. Yeah. It's easy, just don't do it with a random oh. screwdriver or whatever, yeah. just that you, you make some scratches in the, in the brake pads. There is, there is like a tool that, yeah, you can use. You can center uh, in your in your caliper and uh, pushing the pistons back. Yes. You also sometimes need to loop the pistons. Um, when the weather is bad, really bad, it can happen that like a, a, a piston get a little bit stuck. Yeah. But really some loop not you just clean them with with, with some brake cleaner brake to cleaner. get everything clean around so there's yeah. no no dust so it can move so, freely yeah yeah and there's also important to tell the audience here yeah, when you use the brake cleaner try avoid getting that cleaner liquid onto your discs you yeah know, it's only for the for the caliper the brakes correct and just use a towel around it that it don't go like everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. Still talking about brakes. How often should a normal amateur cyclist bleed the brakes? And does it make any difference, you know, if you need to bleed your brakes more often if you mainly ride flat or if you live in the mountains? Yeah, you actually have to to replace. Let's say if if you are just not a professional bike rider, every year it's not bad to get some new oil in yeah. your in your brakes but to bleed it it's actually a closed system so once it's bleeded and it's it's well done there is no air inside it should be good for a year so that's good to know i mean i think a lot of people they they find it super convenient with disc and you know the brake performance and everything but the maintenance is maybe where most people they lag a little bit uh, and it doesn't really take much time but as you said also earlier also just just changing your cables back in the day it was also something that people hardly ever did, yeah. but it's an easy fix. It's low cost and it completely changes your riding experience. And yes. same with discs. Yes. So, uh, and you know, no one wants to have robbing disc or have a bad braking performance. Uh, and it just takes a little bit of, yeah, cleanness and a little bit of adjustments. And then once a year, a bleed, maybe even better bring it to your local bike shop and have them do the professional. Also bleeding. a clean bike. You can save a lot of money if you, you clean the bike and just give some maintenance. So you can save like, yeah, you know, chains, cassettes, Correct. It, it goes longer. Yeah. Take care of it. You are so right. Yeah. The whole drive chain system. Yeah. What do you prefer a vax chain or dry loop? It depends on the circumstances you, you need it. So I would say for a TT, for sure a wax chain. It's also a direction that goes now for road. Yeah. But back in the days, like Nikki Terpstra said, wax is something you put in your hair and it's not to put <laughs> on a chain, you know? So, yeah. but it's a direction that we go now. So wax Things is, is getting, getting important as yeah. well. So, I mean, I've axed my chains as well since many years and it's just, I think it's the same thing about keeping your bike clean and the maintenance uh, because I have, I rotate both my mountain bike, gravel bike, road bikes. I have a rotation of, I think, eight, 10 chains. And I just go through them, also with the ones with my wife, I go through them and I get, when everyone, all of them have been used, then I clean them, I re-wax everything again, hang them up, and then I'm good for almost a year, you yes. know, of, of riding. And they're so easy to clean afterwards. You don't get dirty hands if the chain should pop true. off of your drive chain. So uh, no, it's it's true, yeah. But it's it might seem very difficult for the first time if you start reading about it, but... If you're not used to, yes, yeah. but once you know the system, it's... it's. And then you're gonna, it might also, some people might think, mm -hmm. oh, this is too expensive, but I um, mean, the duration of the cassette, the chain set, uh, the chain, like you said before, everything is... Uh, That's again, you save you save money, money at in the end. end. You have to make term. an investment yeah. to get it first, but then on the long term, yeah. you save money. Yeah. Correct. So Nico, back in the days when when I was racing amateur and elite level for a few years, the smallest gear I ever used in the mountains was 3928 up 
some of those nasty French and Italian climbs. Today, let's say like the last year's penultimate Dero stage, for example, that Bruto, you probably remember time trail of that climb at the Slovenian border. We saw some teams using one by ratio. What was Sudel Quickstep using and how has the compact gearing changed the way we ride and cadence? Well, to make it quite clear, if you prepare a bike and you have like a 39 and a 28 cassette on it, I don't think the rider will start that day. <laughs> so he's going to say, I cannot make it, you know? Yeah. Well, many, many years ago, if you look at the gearing, it's just those guys were just, yeah, from... I don't know, another level, you yeah. know, to get on top of the mountain because the mountain didn't change. Yeah. So, but now in, in that Giro stage, they use like a 34 in front and a 34 in the back, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's almost yeah. mountain bike, you know? But, yeah, but it, that, that's new cycling. Gear is, is getting bigger, the cassettes, you know? Yeah. And it's part of cycling. It's part of cycling, the evolution that's been over the last decade. First with the compact gearing, then with tubeless tires, discs, and everything that we touched on earlier. Now it's uh, yeah. In five uh -huh. years' time, it 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 went so fast. Yeah, the evolution has just changed like completely. Yeah, if you look back on the last five years, the changes we made is like it, it would take twenty years in the past. Yeah. So it it, it goes like like a train, you know. Yeah. I remember last summer in, in um, doing our uh, family holidays in, in Belgium, in Flanders. Uh, my wife and I we went to Odenade for a few days. Heart yeah. of cycling. The heart of cycling, exactly. And it's a beautiful spot, especially there in August and summertime for, for bike holidays, but also your E-City. You're in a one-hour drive, you're out to the coast side, yes. and go to the beach. Ardennes. The Ardennes, exactly. And go and visit Antwerp, uh, Ghent, Bruges. Uh, we went, we rode down also to Robay. Of course, we had to do a few laps inside of the velodrome. You have to. But what I was surprised about coming out like now where I, I'm not saying I never touch my bike anymore, but I ride a lot less compared to before, of course. We live in the mountains in the Italian Dolomite, so she also has some big mountain gearings on her bike. But for myself, when I rode the Koppenberg, and that was first time back on the Koppenberg in 20 years. Of course, last time I rode it was during a time I stayed in Belgium. It was also doing a race, of course, but mm -hmm. I remember to be a lot harder. But now going slower with a 30 three in the back and the 34 in the front because we live in the mountains and I found it like, well, I don't remember it to be between brackets that easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, but it's also if you are used to the longer mountains and then it's just like a hill, small hill. Yeah, yeah, but you know, still, yeah. And it was also August, so you know, the, the tarmac was dry. I mean, well, the couples were dry and that was... Uh, Makes a big difference. Yeah, it does. It does, yeah. Coming back to the tour, when you see, but it could be any race, when you see there's a big crash, like 50 guys going down, of course, the first thing you think of as a, as a cycling fan watching on television is that you hope that all the riders will be okay. And then the next thing that comes into mind is all those broken bikes and spare parts and bar tape, etc., power meters and stuff that's being scratched, maybe ruined. I mean, you as a mechanic, when you're watching this, maybe inside the team car, what goes through your mind? Of course, after been thinking about changing the wheels, getting the guys, you know, going again. Well, it's actually like you switch off electricity. You just switch off your thinking, jump out of the car, and just keep the overview and try to handle as calm as possible. And just, you know, we have a radio, try to be in contact with the radio and just communicate, which is super important. Yeah. So yeah. And then broken parts, it's, it's also part of cycling, you know, it's a pity. It's a waste of money sometimes. It's a lot of money. If you think about what is the average price of one of the, the team bikes? 10, 10 12,000? Uh, now it, it went up to 14,000 euros. 14,000 euros, yeah. And so. then do that by 50. Yeah. Yes. Of course, you always have the all the spare parts in the truck. Yes. But when you see a big crash and maybe you have four or five guys in there, and you may be just at the first stages and dramatic stages of a grand tour. You still got another maybe 18 stages to go. Yes. Yeah, it's 
you know broken parts it's it's part of of what we do but it's always like painful to your heart if yeah. you see like all those broken parts and yeah but yeah it's 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 part of it looking at the weight of the bikes because the the uci limit is 6.8 kilograms do you think the uci could drop it by 500 grams to 6.3 without having any problems with safety issues well i'm actually quite happy with what we have now and i should stick to what we have you can go to 6.6 maybe but i don't think there is need to go less because um, I had a really good talk with with Michael Morkov yeah. last year and also on the gearing and whatever he said maybe there has to come like a limitation on, on the gearing we are using because we are going so fast that it's probably not safe anymore so you can make everything lighter and faster but where will it stop yeah so it's better to just draw a line and say that's what it is yeah so yeah because that's also one thing that i i've spoken to michael about since he's more from the older generation but he's also a guy who has seen it all uh, he's also one of the most technical skilled professional cyclists in in the pro peloton especially with coming with his track background but we were talking about safety we didn't discuss weight but we discussed that all the younger guys now pointing in the levers to have this more like talked aerodynamic position where also due to Michael, sometimes it could be dangerous, you know, I mean, you could risk a bit of the safety because sometimes so getting quickly on the levers and, and the brakes for braking could be an issue maybe. But the UCI is working on that as well. Okay, so yeah. there will come, come. It will come. Okay. So I got a meeting last week with, with the UCI. So the inclination of the levers, they, they are going to make a tool. And once it's ready, they're going to send it to all the teams and then they're going to say, yeah, sorry guys, we are on this moment, but it's a rule for everybody. And I think it's what we need, all the yeah. crashes we see and, and yeah, something has to change. Yeah. Because no, I mean, it's all for the rider safety in the end. You yeah. Know? If so I look back at the start of the season of 2023. You know, we have like a big box where we just throw broken parts and it got full after three months, which oh, really? we almost never get full on, on a whole season. Yeah. So now after three months and we said like, if we continue like this, we're going to end up some, we just without material, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, it's good that we get some some rules to some make rules. it yeah. clear for everybody everybody on the same page yeah yes because as much as we all know the more you go narrow also on the handlebars and with the levers pointed in you don't really have that balance on the bike that you you'll no. be able to steer better uh, than if you compare like a mountain bike and then a road bike yeah it it, it makes sense yeah. while you have a wider yeah handlebar and and I'm fully into aero and yes, we need to go as aero and as fast as possible. So you need a narrow, but not too narrow. Not too narrow. No, no, I agree. I agree. Nico, two last questions. Do you have a favorite tool or bike part? A favorite tool? I would say my, my whole toolbox is like gold for me. I don't like that somebody else is just taking tools from my toolbox. It's It's like it's your, personal your kids you know yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's mine yeah so and you probably can pick whatever tool you are looking for with your eyes closed yeah yeah because yeah you know where they are yeah you know yeah so but yeah an allen key that you get in your hands every day so yeah. and how often do you get to ride your bike knowing that you are spending all this time on the road at races in meetings testing recons how often do you get to ride your bike well, um, not enough because I was a bike rider many years ago and I still have also on that part the passion of just to ride my bike and enjoy, you know, I, I have no will to get a number on my back, but just to make some loops and 
Just get out one hour, spinning the legs, just, just one hour, one mind. and a half hour, just switch off without thinking and just get that good feeling, you know? Yeah. And I, I don't get it enough anymore. So I'm going to work on that um, for myself because yeah, during the Corona, when we were home, I just picked it again and I did like uh, trips from six, seven hours again. And uh, it, it, it all came back and I just realized that it's important to be healthy as well. It is. It is. So. Also keeping a healthy life balance, especially when you have a stressful job like yourself, it's very important. Yes, it is. It is. Nico, thank you so much. It was an honor to have you on and it was super interesting and exciting. You're uh, welcome. Thanks a million for being our guest on My today's pleasure. show. And we all learned a lot of things, including myself. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Really. And I uh, look forward to see you down the road at the races. Yes, for sure. Okay, take care. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.